I'm Neil Madden. I'm the author of uh, API Security in Action, published by Manning. This book covers all, all aspects of kind of API security, so how to secure your APIs running on the server. Uh, it goes through kind of basic kind of secure coding and then kind of um, session cookies up to things like JSON Web Tokens and OAuth2. And at the end, we kind of get into kind of um, microservice, microservice APIs and Kubernetes and things like um, Internet of Things APIs as well. But tonight I'm going to talk about something that isn't actually covered in this book explicitly. A lot of the advice still applies um, uh, to it. So if you follow the advice in the book, you'll you'll um, also be in pretty good shape uh, with regards to this vulnerability. And this is Spectre, um, which was a, a kind of, um, it's not really one vulnerability, it's a kind of family of vulnerabilities that were discovered along with another um, similar vulnerability called Meltdown, discovered around kind of 2017 time and made public early 2018. And these are quite interesting vulnerabilities because they they attack vulnerabilities in, in the hardware, in the CPU itself that the hardware is running on. In the case of Meltdown, that attacked um, something called um, out-of-order execution, which is a, a feature of CPUs that that executes code slightly out of order from the um, the order in which the instructions appear in the program. Now, Meltdown was quite serious because it it allowed you to kind of um, cut through lots of layers of security and read operating system kernel memory. So it was pretty serious, and that that in turn allowed you to read memory of potentially other processes. Uh, and because it was doing this at the hardware level, it was cutting through all the layers of security. So if you think like a modern application running, uh, it's typically running on a server somewhere, maybe in the cloud. It's maybe probably these days running in something like Docker, a container environment with various kind of hardening applied to that. Uh, and then you've got that's running on, on the host operating system uh, where there's kind of permissions and various kinds of layers of security at that level. And then you might be running on a virtual machine and all this kind of layers of security. Underneath all that, you've got this hardware running on your CPU. Uh, and these vulnerabilities are cutting through and, and exploiting vulnerabilities in the hardware, which means that all these layers kind of um, get bypassed. So Meltdown was, was pretty severe, but it was also um, relatively easy to to patch and there's now patches available for most operating systems that mitigate um, meltdown. Spectre on the other hand is more, as I said, it's more of a kind of family of vulnerabilities rather than any one specific vulnerability. Um, and so it was much harder to patch and some variants of it have kind of been uh, patched and mitigated, but other, others haven't really. Some of them are still kind of um, potentially exploitable now. So in this talk, I'm gonna um, talk a little bit tonight about Spectre. Um, how it works, which is quite kind of uh, low level. So I'll try and explain it uh, in simplified terms to try and help help people understand um, what's going on with Spectre and, and why it's a serious vulnerability and what it means in terms of people developing web applications. So one of the interesting things about Spectre is it it's not just a, a kind of low level vulnerability that you exploit by running, you know, um, low level like C code, you know, on a, directly on a machine, but you can actually exploit it through JavaScript running in a browser. Um, so that makes it very dangerous because you can you can run JavaScript in a browser in a web page that exploits this Spectre vulnerability and dumps uh, memory that um, you shouldn't be able to access. And so it kind of breaks some of these security boundaries in the browser. So I'll talk a little bit about how that works. I'll show you a little demo um, that the Chrome security team of have knocked together, um, showing a, a kind of exploit of um, Spectre within a browser. I'll go on and then talk about some of the, now the kind of dust has settled on these um, vulnerabilities. It's starting to emerge some best practices and things to do in terms of web development and in API development for the web um, to try and minimize the, the impact uh, of a Spectre vulnerability on your web applications. Google have this nice page called uh, leaky.page uh, and there they've put up a proof of concept um, kind of exploit for Spectre. And there's a whole series of pages you can work for, through here which kind of to some extent explain how Spectre 
works, although you do need a, a bit of background knowledge already. And then they've got this, it kind of culminates with this working um, demo of an exploit of Spectre. So this is, a, a you know, running in the latest Chrome. So on my Mac, I've got the latest Chrome. Um, so it's all patched and up to date. Um, and yet when I run this, you can see it's what it's doing here, this kind of what's made to look like a hex dump here on the right, is actually dumping the memory of the Chrome process that is running this this web page. So if I run it here, hopefully it'll work. It's sometimes a little bit fiddly. In fact, I store, installed a um, Chrome update um, just uh, the other day, and it's actually become a little bit harder to exploit this now, I've noticed. So these, these blocks here should all be A's uh, if it's been exploited properly. And you can see they're quite noisy. So I'll try and run it again and see if we can do it any better. Uh, but it was working quite well, but they've obviously made some changes in Chrome again, I think, which have um, perhaps um, made it harder to exploit again. Also, this demo was designed to run uh, in Linux rather than Mac. So this is running on a Mac. So it's been kind of, uh, in order to exploit um, Spectre, it's often quite, you have to be quite specific to the particular CPU and the architecture of the, the machine you're running on. All right, so it's kind of done something. It's not as good as I've had it done before, but it's kind of working. So what you can see here, these zeros at the start, that's an array, a JavaScript array that was created in memory by um, the code that's exploiting this. So it creates this array full of zeros. And then it kind of uses Spectre to basically read beyond the end of that array and read memory beyond the end of that array, which is just the raw memory of, of the process running in the browser process. These AAAAA bits, which should all be A's, but it's obviously um, getting a bit more noisy because it's not able to exploit the vulnerability as well. These are other arrays that it puts in memory just so you can see um, some stuff. So these are other JavaScript arrays that have been filled with capital letter A or 41 in hex. And in between them, we've got we've got some other stuff, which is just, you know, how they happen to be laid out in memory. And then beyond them, we've also got, you know, other memory beyond the end of even that up to, you know, quite a significant amount of memory that we've managed to dump from from the browser process. And this is in in JavaScript. So you can see that it, it's, it's being able to break um, the memory safety of JavaScript and read memory of the browser that we shouldn't be able to read. And the impact of that is that, uh, you know, potentially it means that JavaScript running in your browser can read stuff. The security model of the browser should prevent it from reading. So uh, when you're running code within a browser, there's a security policy known as the same origin policy, which kind of... Um, says which JavaScript should have access to, to which other stuff running um, in the browser. So particularly, JavaScript should only generally have access to things that have been served from the same server that served that, that JavaScript, the same origin, and not from other, other domains or other websites. So in particular, you know, if you make a um, request to another website to read some data, um, typically, uh, you might be allowed to make the request, but you, you'll be blocked in JavaScript from reading the response. And, you know, if you've done any work with cause, cause allows you to kind of relax this and, and in certain cases allow that to succeed. But if you haven't enabled cause, then you'd expect that nobody could read your data um, in, and then be able to read the response because that would break the security model of, of the web. You know, if you, you've got an API that's returning potentially sensitive information based on a cookie, you know, that's sent with the request, you don't want some other site to be able to make, make that call to your API and get back that data and read it. And so browsers will, will typically block um, that from occurring. But if you've got a, a vulnerability like Spectre that you exploit, then potentially a, an attacker can load that data back into the browser. The browser will stop it being able to read it, but then it can run this Spectre exploit to dump the memory and read the stuff anyway. So Spectre is potentially really quite serious. And you can see that it's, you know, this proof of concept is running in a modern patched Chrome uh, on an up-to-date operating system. So that's the impact of Spectre and why it's um, so problematic. And if you think as well, it's not just the data on the page, 
but potentially within this browser process as well, you've got things like cookies, tokens in um, local storage and things like this, you know, credentials that can then be used to go and access other stuff. So you don't want those to leak either. So in terms of how it actually works, I'll tell you a little bit about how Spectre works in a kind of simplified way. When I was kind of um, initially getting into computers when I was young, you know, I'm going to age myself here now, but, you know, they, they were... Um, uh, a ZX Spectrum was my first computer at the end of the kind of 1980s. And and CPUs then were, were really relatively simple and quite easy to understand, even for, you know, somebody, you know, just approaching their teens. Whereas now, obviously, they're, they're completely different, much more complicated and much more sophisticated. Uh, and they have a lot of features now that are designed to improve performance. Um, and and Spectre and Meltdown kind of exploit some of the complex interactions between these features. So um, in particular, you know, in the kind of 1970s and maybe in the 80s, although I'm not sure how true it was even then, the time it took to execute a CPU instruction wasn't that different to the time it takes to go out to main memory and, and retrieve some data from memory. So those things, you know, took, took about the kind of same uh, length of time which meant that your CPU could be quite slow. So if it was if it was executing this code, for instance, and it came to this um, if statement, obviously compiled down to um, machine language, and it needs to go and fetch this array length from memory, that's fine. It would just stop and wait for that to go off and fetch it from memory. But, you know, if, if you think about CPUs now, CPUs have got hugely faster over the intervening decades, whereas going out to mem main memory is still relatively slow. That has also got faster, but nowhere near uh, at the same rate as CPUs. So accessing main memory now is, is now orders of magnitude slower than executing some CPU instructions. And so CPUs do a lot of tricks to kind of hide that delay. So first of all, they have a lot of caches on board now. So um, when you go and access some data in memory, it will load it first into a cache on the CPU. And then, um, you know, if it needs to access it again, which it probably will do, um, it can just access it from the cache, which is much, much faster than having to go out onto the kind of memory bus and um, access this other other chips for the memory. And that's one thing. And th there's now this kind of multiple layers of caches and this kind of cache hierarchy. But the other things it's done is it, it's done lots of tricks now to kind of um, even then to kind of reduce the, the apparent um, delay. And one of the tricks it does is something called speculative execution. This is where Spectre gets its name. It's um, based on the speculative execution, which is a little bit like running a, a database transaction. And in particular, the, the one we're going to look at here is based on something called branch, branch prediction. So if you've got this if statement here, and it's going to access this, this array, but before it accesses it, it's going to check that the index you're trying to access is, is less than the array length. So it's going to do a bounds check. And this might be in your code or it might be in, you know, if you're using Java or JavaScript, they do these checks automatically. They automatically check that um, uh, the index you're trying to access is within the bounds of the array so that you can't just read some memory beyond the end of the array, which was a common source of bugs in, in languages like C or C++. But either way, there's this if statement and it's going to have to check this um, array length and then based on whether that's either true or false, it's either going to execute this code or it's going to come down and execute this code. So these are the two branches. And because this array length might not be in cache, um, it might have to go out to main memory to, to fetch that to be able to work out whether this is going to be true or false. And that's going to take a long time. Uh, so while it's waiting for that to happen, rather than sitting there and doing nothing, what the CPU does is it guesses which way it's going to go. Uh, and it guesses based on, you know, say if this was in a for loop or it's a function that's been called multiple times, it, it keeps track of what happened last time it was here. And so if, you know, the last two or three times we've gone to this if statement, this has been true, then it's going to guess that we're going to end up in this then block rather than the else block. And so it will start what's called speculatively executing the instructions in here which is, like I said, it's a bit like a database transaction. It starts executing them, but it doesn't It doesn't make the effects of those instructions kind of visible um, just yet. It kind of buffers up the results of those instructions in memory. 
And then when this array length comes back from memory and it can work out this uh, whether this condition is true or false, it then knows whether whether it got it right and whether this speculatively executed code was supposed to have happened or not. Uh, and if this was true and it and it guessed correctly, then it kind of commits that speculative execution and carries on as it, as if it did, as if as if this had just taken no time at all, basically. So it's won a lot of time by doing that. And potentially it could execute hundreds of instructions speculatively. So it's a, a huge time saving. But if it gets it wrong and it turns out that this wasn't this index was wasn't less than the array length, then it rolls back everything that it's done and it comes back to here and then it jumps into this else branch instead. So it throws away all the work it did in here, which is exactly like kind of rolling back a database transaction. And the idea is that that's supposed to completely undo all the effects. So the fact, you know, we've got an eight byte array here but i'm trying to access index 100 which is well beyond the end of that but it might speculatively access that and it and it's you know updates this sum variable based on what's in element 100 which is actually just some random bit of memory beyond the end of the array that we shouldn't be able to access uh, but because it's going to just undo all of that we shouldn't be able to see any of any of that so it, it won't matter at least that's that was the theory that it shouldn't matter because we'll we'll never actually see the result of that, so we can't do anything with it. So this is what Spectre proved to be false, basically, and it proved to be false because of the caches that I mentioned before. So um, when this gets undone, it undoes all of the effects of this this data, but it doesn't undo any changes that were made to the cache. And so if this wasn't in cache before. Uh, and it gets speculatively executed, then it might be brought into the cache. And then we might be able to see then afterwards by measuring very fine level, we can measure how long it takes to access different array elements. We can work out which bit got brought into the cache. And the way we do that is we create a new array, which we'll call our probe array. And this will have, um, 256 elements, uh, one for each possible element in a byte, each possible value of a byte, multiplied by some kind of factor that spreads them out a bit. So this 512 or 4096, I think, is used in the original paper. Um, and the reason for this is a little bit technical, and I'll maybe talk about it in, in a minute as to why we're kind of spreading these out. But what we do here is we, rather than... Um, using our array element directly. We're going to, um, uh, sorry, multiply by 4096. We're gonna index into our probe array based on the value of our other array, the value that we look up in here. So this is this out of bounds read. So we're gonna look at some value at index 100 that is far beyond the end of our array. And whatever byte is there is going to come back and then we're going to use that to index into our probe array. Now I have to, because this is Java, I actually have to do a little um, uh, extra trick here uh, because Java bytes are between minus 128 and 127. So I have to add this mask to make it a value between zero and 256 so that that's actually uh, a valid index into my array. But you can ignore that detail. So we're going to get back some value here. So let's say, you know, at index 100 beyond the end of this 8-byte array, you know, say there's the value 42 in memory, right? Although that is the values I've put in here. But say, say there's a value 52, for instance. Now this is going to come back as 52, get multiplied by 4K, and we're going to access that part of this probe array. So what we can do is we can arrange, before we run this code, we can arrange to flush this entire probe array from the cache to make sure none of it's in the cache. And there's various ways you can do that, which I won't go into. They're very kind of very specific to a particular environment. And then we're going to access this and, and we're going to also flush this array length out of the cache, but not the array contents. So what's going to happen is the code's going to come down here. It's going to go, oh, I've got to go off to main memory to get this array length. Uh, so while I'm doing that, I'm going to speculatively execute this and I'm going to access this out of bounds value in this array and use that 
the value of that to index into this probe array and add that to the sum. But then I'm going to undo it all afterwards because this turns out to be out of bounds. But now behind here, I can now write some code that looks like the following. And what it's going to do is it's going to um, use a high precision timer. In this case, I'm writing Java code, so I'm going to use um, system.nanotime. If you're in JavaScript, there's a bunch of, um, well, there were a bunch of um, high precision timers. So there's thing, something called performance.now, which used to exist and sort of still exists, was removed after Spectre, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to access um, my probe array at this element, you know, and I'm just going to do, you know, sum plus equals probe array again, uh, multiplied by 4096. And so I'm timing how long it takes to access each element of the array or each four kilobyte spread out element of the array, depending on what the value of the byte is. Now, one of these is going to be much faster than the others. So if n minus star is less than, I don't know, some threshold value, that will tell me that um, that element of the array was in the cache rather than in memory because accessing stuff from the cache is much faster than going to memory. And the only reason it would be in the cache was because it was cached here when we speculatively executed this code. And that tells me what the value of this array, out of bounds array index was, because it will be the same value of i here that's then caused this to be faster. So that is the trick that Spectre um, exploits. So we come down here, the CPU speculatively executes this code. Uh, it accesses some data out, out of bounds of the array beyond the end of our array, which is just a, an array in our language, like in JavaScript. Um, it then uses that to index into some other array, which causes that part of that array to be cached. It then undoes everything apart from the cache, and then we can use high precision timers down here to work out which element was cached. And that's how Spectre works. And that's the kind of how we end up then um, dumping all this memory. Now, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. You can go and look at the code that Google Security on GitHub. So Google Security Research Proof of Concepts, and there's this leaky page thing. Uh, it's linked from the leaky page site and you can see all of the details that they have to put into a real world exploit of this and they had to go through a lot of kind of stages of building a proof of concept in c and then slowly replacing parts of it with browser features in the browser and eventually coming up with this um, javascript thing and as you can see on mine you know it used to work perfectly here i've updated chrome and it's it's now not working quite so well on my mac i don't know how well it still works on linux be worth um, giving it a try but there's lots of these details you know they um they're not reading individual bytes they actually read individual bits um and they kind of repeat it multiple times to kind of um, uh, reduce the noise and there's a bunch of other stuff they have to do um you know so you have to kind of evict this array length from memory while not evicting any of the actual array contents from memory so there's lots of these things you have to do and every time you read something you have to set up the cache carefully every time just to make a single read uh, of a single bit it's quite complicated but you know you still get to read you know 128 bytes in in a second you know that's quite slow actually so yeah this is slowed down yeah 300 seconds 300 milliseconds uh, was what I was getting before. Um, so I think it's having to repeat things multiple times now to try and average out the noise. So that's the kind of impact of Spectre and that's how it how it works. In terms of the, um, the mitigations then, obviously when Spectre came out, browser vendors kind of um, rushed to kind of plug these holes. Um, and there were various operating system patches that fixed Meltdown and fixed some of the variants of Spectre. And browsers made a lot of changes as well to try and make Spectre harder to exploit. So as I said, they removed these high resolution timers like performance.now, um, leaving only the kind of millisecond precision timers like uh, new, new date and, and things like that. The difference between accessing data in a cache and accessing data from main memory is, is usually, you know, less than a millisecond. It's hundreds of microseconds. Um, so you need a higher resolution timer than that to be able to tell the difference. 